We're going to start um, a series. Uh, I, ca- I emailed John this week, texted John this week. What series have you done? I didn't want to start a series that he had been in, and he hadn't mentioned the Psalms. So I'm going to start a series in the Psalms. And you see I'm starting with the first one. No! I'm going to jump all over the place in there. We're going to talk today about, about Psalm 100. But before we do, many churches have the tradition of having a bulletin where the announcements are all in there and things are in there. And many times the church secretary mistypes some things in there and they don't proofread it, you know, so it goes out to the whole congregation and they read it. And there are sometimes there are some various humorous things in the church bulletin. I got a few of those here. I like this first one. Um, misspelled a word instead of an L, they got an H, and it says, if you choose to heave during the postlude, please do so (laughs) quietly so others may continue to worship. I think that was supposed to be a leave there. Another one. Um, Scouts are saving aluminum cans, bottles, and other items to be recycled. Proceeds will be used to cripple children. (laughs) What are they doing to them, you know? Here's another, here's another one. The audience is asked to remain seated until the end of the whole entire recession is over. That might be a couple years before the <laughs> recession is over. Huh? The third verse of Blessed Assurance will be sung without musical accomplishment. <laughs> so, so they played real poorly on that third verse when they did that. And then here's one. They had a guest speaker. During the absence of our pastor, we enjoyed the rare privilege of hearing a good sermon when J.F. Stubbs supplied our pulpit. I don't know if the, if the secretary meant to word it that way, but it sent a message to that pastor that uh, this guy was better than you were in his sermons. Huh? Well, all right, let's get into it. Psalm 100. Let me give you a little background of, of Psalm 100. We do not know who wrote this psalm. Many people think, well, David wrote all of the psalms, but he did not. Uh, We know there are some in there that Moses wrote. Yeah, Moses wrote some psalms that are in the psalms. Um, John, Pastor John mentioned last week a psalm that was written by, I've lost the name, Asaph. Asaph was the choir director for under Solomon for the the temple worship. Um, Many psalms say in the Hebrew, Le David, of David. And we know then those are probably written by David, but this one does not. So we don't know who wrote this psalm. It does mention in it about God being our shepherd. So many do think it was David, going back to Psalm 23, but we do not know that for certain. Secondly, um, this is a psalm of ascent. Now, it does not say that. If you were to look at Psalm 120, all the way from Psalm 120 to Psalm 134, they are titled Psalms of Ascent. But Jewish tradition includes this one with the Psalms of Ascent. Now, what does that mean? Those are special Psalms that were memorized. Psalms are songs. They were songs that were memorized by the Jewish people. And as they came to the temple on the various Jewish holidays, and they would ascend, the temple was kind of on a hill, they call it the Temple Mount. They would ascend and walk in that, up to that hill to gather as a group, and they would all join in singing these songs to gather as they came up to the temple. It would be like on Sunday morning if we all gathered out in the parking lot And then as we, this morning, we wouldn't have had very good success walking up that sidewalk, we would sing a song together as we came up to the doors of the church. That's what the song of ascent meant. So as a group, the people coming to worship had this psalm memorized, and I say recite, they really sang it together as they walked to the temple in order to worship God. The topic of this psalm is about worship. Okay, so we're going to look at, so so I say, this psalm is a song that can teach us how to worship the Lord as a group of believers coming together. There are a number of commands in this psalm of what we are to do in our worship. Now, both a group worship as a local church and individual worship in our lives. You know, worship, you say, you ask a normal Christian, you say, well, when did you worship the Lord? And he says, ah, I worship on Sunday mornings. Well, worship is something that can be done throughout our daily lives. Jesus said to the Samaritan woman, you think we should worship you on this mountain. 
talking about Mount Gerizim where the Samaritans worship. He says the Jews worship in the temple because that's what was prescribed in the Old Testament. But then Jesus said to her, the day is coming and now is where you can worship God in spirit and in truth. The location doesn't matter. We should be able to worship the Lord anytime, anywhere. In fact, we're going to talk about it. Paul and Silas were in jail at midnight and they were worshiping the Lord at midnight. So we should be able to worship. So this psalm will teach us some things about worship. Now, this psalm can be divided up into two categories. Each verse um, can be, each verse is either of one category or the other category. The first category is why we should worship him. It talks about how great God is, who God is. It tells us God attributes of God, okay? Those are why. Why should we worship God? Because he is God, because he is our creator. We're going to look at those individually. And then secondly, how we are to practice that worship. It gives us some kind of a verb of what we are to do in our worship. So I've divided this psalm up into why we should worship and how we should, uh, how we should practice our worship. All right, so let's look at our text. Our text only has five verses in it, so we're going to read the entire um, text here. I believe I have the New International Version up here. Psalm 100, starting at verse 1. A psalm for thanksgiving. Now, that first verse really isn't part of verse 1. It is the title. When I copied this from the Internet, they didn't know where to put that title, so they stuck it at the beginning of Psalm 1. Now, I want to tell you something about these psalm titles. Sometimes if you have a study Bible, you will have a title at the top of your psalm that the author of the study Bible has put up there, telling you a bit about what the psalm is about, okay? Those titles are good for you, they're interesting, tell you what the psalm is about, but those are man's words, okay? But some of the psalms, not all of them, some of them have titles that are in the original manuscripts that are a part of the Word of God. This one is a part of the Word of God. It calls it a psalm. It's a Hebrew word meaning a worship song. And then it says, for thanksgiving. That word means for a uh, praise and worship or thankfulness as you come to God in the temple. So it has a title for it. Now verse 1. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful song. Now, before I go on, let's think about our why and our how, okay? The why talks about how great God is, who God is. The how is giving us verbs, telling us what to do. Verse 1, after that opening title, is that a verb telling us what to do, or is it telling us about God? That's the verb telling us what to do, isn't it? Shout for joy to the Lord. So that is a how. Verse 2, worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful song. Again, a how, right? Verse 3, know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. A how or a why? Well, here we've switched from a how to why now, telling us why we should worship him, because God, are, is, God is these things, okay? Verse 4, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and worship his, and praise his name. A how or a why? A how, yeah. Verse 5, for the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generation. Now we have a, a why. So verses 1 and 2 are how. Verse 3 is a why. Verse 4 is a how. Verse 5 is a why. Okay, now, I was wishing that I could have somehow divide my slide and have the full text on one side and have my points on the other and stuff like that, but I, I, didn't, I didn't do that. But what I did now here is I've tore the whole psalm all apart and I've divided the whys and the hows out from one another, okay? So that's going to be our points for today. I only have two points. Now I have a whole bunch of sub points, so don't get too excited. Uh, oh boy, we're going to get out of here early today. Um, I have two point, main points. Why? Talking about who God is. And then how? The second point. But as I say, a bunch of sub points. I've tore this passage all apart talking about that. Okay, so let's, uh, 
Let's jump into my sermon here. All of that was introduction. Now we're going to get into the sermon. Okay, why should we, just as the Old Testament people came to the temple and worshiped God, why should we as believers, we have the same God as they worshiped in the Old Testament, why should we worship as believers? Well, number one, probably self-explanatory. He is God. Huh? It says, know that the Lord, talking about his name, the Lord is God. Now, back in the Old Testament, they had all kind, Israel had all kinds of nations around them, and every single nation had a different God, had multiple gods, idols that they worshipped. They had Dagon, they had Baal, they had a whole bunch of different um, gods that they worshipped. I, I remember that story, I was launching it, but that story where um, when, when the Philistines captured the Ark of the Covenant and they brought it to Dagon's temple and they put it in the temple with this great big huge stone that they worship called Dagon. It was a, Dagon is considered to be a fish god and this was probably a great big stone depicting Dagon. And do you remember that story? What happened during the night? The stone fell over face down before the Ark of the Covenant. You know, I thought oh, that was kind of neat. The Lord just said to that, to that rock, why don't you bow down to me? That rock says, okay, and the rock bowed down and began to worship. But they had all kinds of gods being worshipped around them. And the psalmist wants you to know that the Lord is the one and only and true God. So he alone deserves our worship. Remember when Solomon got older, Solomon had how many wives? 300 wives and 700 concubines. He had a thousand of them to deal with. Well, a lot of them, and they were a lot of them were pagan wives because it was practiced in those days that they would marry um, princesses of other countries and, and kind of uniting nations together. And the Bible tells us that Solomon, in his old age, being influenced by these pagan worshiping wives, began to build temples to them and allowed the practice of worshiping other gods in Israel. What a sad situation that is. I hope in my, Dan and I were just talking about our elderly years here, how old we're getting I hope in my older years that I remain faithful to the Lord and don't allow worldliness to creep into my life. Solomon allowed the worship of other gods. The psalmist here wants us to know why should we worship him? Because he is the only one and true God. Now we think, well, we don't have idols around in our lives. Oh, do we not? You remember, uh, John, here's a test for them, okay? Do you remember what John preached on last week? Oh, I got you there. What did he preach on? About pizza. That's right. That's, that's what he remembers. He don't know any of the spiritual lessons, but he remembers the food swaps that they had there. Yeah. About money, Ananias and Sapphira, and how they could have idols. We might have idols in our life. Things in our life that are more important to us than what our relationship with God is. Know that the Lord is God. Secondly, he is creator. Way back, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Let's see here. Genesis 1, 1. Genesis 1, 1. That's a verse in the Bible, and it says, in Yeah, in the beginning, God created. God is creator. Um, you just imagine with me, you take a pottery class. Can you go in? They give you that wheel and you got, now they're electric. Back in the biblical times, they had a big spinning wheel underneath that you spun with your feet and it would spin this. Let's just say it's a modern one and they got this electric and it starts spinning. They give you this lump of clay and plop it down there. And you're supposed to take this lump of clay and you put your hands on it and you begin to mold it and shape it and you shape it up into a, into a really nice vase. And you guys, you think, well, I'll make this vase. Yeah, what guys are going to take pottery class? So anyway, you make, this, you make this nice vase and you say, well, I'll put that in the kiln and glaze it pretty colors and I'll give it to my wife for her birthday. But just before you get it done, that vase all of a sudden says to you, hey, bud, I don't want to be no vase. Make me into a candy bowl. I don't want to be a candy bowl. 
What? Don't you talk to me that way. Does that vase have any right to talk to you that way? No. You are his creator. You can make him into whatever you want. God is our creator. Why should we worship him? Because he is our creator. He owns us. Go on to the next one. Oh, I'm sorry. Here's the scripture. It is he who made us in that verse. Verse 3. Let us see. He owns us. And we are his. And we are his. His is what kind of a pronoun? All you English people, I'm going to take you back to your eighth grade English class. His is a, Dan, I saw you whisper it, a possessive pronoun. Yes. We belong to God. We are his. Any of you have ever heard of the ministry called CEF, Child Evangelism Fellowship? Wonderful evangelical evangelistic ministry. It produces material that you can do backyard Bible clubs and, and uh, vacation Bible schools and stuff with. They used to have, and, they, and of course they make these portable. Usually they make them in little books that are kind of big so that you get a group of kids sitting on the back lawn and you can work your way through the story with pictures. Well, they always had a story about a little boy who went to his dad's garage, found a block of wood. He got his dad's saw and he cut off the front of it so the point was, it had a point on it. And then he took a, a rod, he drilled a hole and he put that rod in there. And then he got some, some cloth and he made himself a sail. So he had a little toy sailboat that he had made. And he loved that toy. And one of the reasons that he loved it is because he had made it, huh? Well, the story goes on. He brought it down to the stream. He put it in the stream and whoosh, the water took it. And the boy tried to keep up with it, but the boy fell way behind. And, and he was very sad because he lost his boat. Well, then the story goes on that a few days later, he was walking home from school and he walked by the toy shop and as he walked by the toy shop, he looked in the window, and there, to his surprise, was his boat for sale. And he went running in there and says, Mr. Shop Owner, that boat, it's mine. And that shop owner says, no, I had a kid who found it, and he brought it in here, and I bought it off of him, and now it's for sale in my shop. The only way you can get it is for you to purchase it. So the kid runs home, and he gets his penny bank, and he crashes his penny bank and he counts all of his coins and it was just enough and he comes back to the toy owner he dumps all his coins out and the toy owner gives him his boat back and as he walks out he says you are twice mine now i made you and i bought you well that's what the lord did the Lord is our creator, deserves our worship and praise, but man rebelled against him. And then Jesus came and died on the cross for our salvation and purchased us back to redeem our lives. We are twice bought. We are his. We are twice owned because he made us and he bought us. We are his, so we should worship him. Let's go on. He is our shepherd he is our shepherd. Jesus says in the New Testament, I am the good shepherd. The shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And then he talks about the hireling. The hireling sees a wolf, sees danger, and he runs. The hireling. Somebody, the shepherd had an appointment. The shepherd had to go somewhere. So he hires his brother-in-law or hires some, some guy to watch the sheep while he's gone. He loved those sheep, and he had a hard time leaving them, but he hired this guy. And this guy is out there kind of watching the sheep, kind of texting on his cell phone while he's out in the field watching the sheep, not paying any attention. And all of a sudden, he looks up, and there's a wolf, a bear, a lion attacking the sheep. And that hireling, he didn't care about the sheep. He says, whoa, I'm getting out of here. And he runs. But the good shepherd would give his life for the sheep. Remember, David, young little David, came to bring his brothers some food when they were in the army. 
And as he comes into camp, great across the valley, a great big um, um, guy, giant, was yelling out, you send your strongest warrior to come fight me. And none of the Israelites would do it. And then that guy, that Goliath, he cursed the name of God. And that infuriated David. And David went into Saul and said, Saul, I'm going to fight that giant. I'm not afraid of him because he has dishonored our God's name. And Saul says, well, what makes, think you, what makes you think you can do it? And David says, well, I used to tend my dad's sheep. And one time a lion came and I went out and I slew that lion. One time a bear came and I went out and I slew that bear protecting the sheep. If David did write this psalm, David knew what it was to have a shepherd's heart. God loves us. God will take care of us as a shepherd cares for the sheep. Remember the story of the 99? The one is lost. The shepherd puts the 99 into a foal and leaves them there. And he goes out and he hunts high and low and finally finds that one lost sheep and brings him back. That's the kind of a heart the Lord has for us. If we think of that, that's what God thinks of us. We should worship him because he is our shepherd. Going on. He is the sheep of his pasture. I, I have my points and I forget to show you the quote from scripture. Letter E, he is good. There we go. For the Lord is good. <laughs> Pretty plain, isn't it? For the Lord is good. Listen, people. Out of everything I... Talk about in this sermon, John, I noticed last week you would give Dell fits because you were moving all over on the platform and Dell is trying to find you with that camera. So I'll do a little walking here. One lesson that I want you to take home from here is this. The Lord is good. The Lord is good. Let me tell you, I have, there have been a number of people that I have done counseling with and talked with in their lives, problems come into their life, difficulties come into their life. They know that the Lord is sovereign. They know that the Lord has control of that, but they're in pain, they're hurting, and they cry out and they say, Lord, why have you brought this in my life? And they doubt the goodness of God. This is a truth that we need to grab a hold of and hang on to that whatever comes in our life, God has allowed it in our life because he is working in our life and doing something in our life and it is really for a good purpose in our life. I saw on a, um, America's Funniest Video, there was this guy who had a dog and the dog grabbed a hold of the end of the rope and I think the rope was on one of those turnaround um, 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 laundry clothes, clothes hanging things outside, yeah. And so he starts spinning that, and the dog is running, and all of a sudden the dog lifts off the ground, and the dog is hanging onto that rope while it is flying around and around and around. If he had let go of that rope, he would have gone flying. But he tenaciously hung onto that rope. That's what we need to do with this truth. Whenever we go through hard times in our life, whenever we go through difficulties, we need to say, wait a minute, God is sovereign, God's in control, and God is good. And he means it for a good purpose in our life. Boy, that should cause us to fall down and worship him. God is good. He is loving. And his love endures forever. That's an interesting word, that word love in the Old Testament. You've probably heard messages and you know about in the New Testament, you got a phileo love and you got agape love. You know, you got several different words there for love. In the Old Testament, the word that's often translated for love, sometimes it's translated as mercy. It's the Old Testament word chesed. And when you pronounce that in Hebrew, you got to get that guttural sound in the back of your tongue there. The chesed love for the Lord. Chesed, meaning God's covenant love for the people of Israel. And that brought over into the New Testament means the agape love that God has unconditionally for us. His love endures forever. He loves us. He is our creator. 
He owns us. He is our shepherd, and he loves us, and he is good, so we should worship him. One, one more. Last part of five says, his faithfulness continues through all generations. His faithfulness. I want you to think about that word faithfulness. If we were talking about, ah, you need to get involved here. Wake some of you sleepers up here. If we were to say somebody is faithful, Joe is faithful, all right, or, or Dan is faithful, okay, we're talking about the character quality of their Christian life. What qualities, what would that mean in their life if we call them faithful? What would that mean? Come on, you can talk back to me. Come on, come on. What does that mean that they're faithful? They What's that? They persevere. They keep plodding on. Yeah, they're faithful. One of the things it means is that they will do what they said they will do. God is faithful. God, uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, well-known verse. No temptation has taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful. Yeah, God will do what he says he will do, he will keep on, he will plot along, he will do it. God is faithful. God is dependable. You can depend on God. God will do what he says he will do. We often take about, and I realize you've got to read them in context, and you've got to be careful that you don't um, claim a verse that really isn't supposed to be claimed by you. Some of you women where Sarah was promised a child in her old years. I don't know that that's a promise of God to your life, you know. So you got to be careful about that. But, but um, there are promises that God gives to us, and we need to grab those, and we need to claim those and hang on to those because God will carry those out. He is faithful. Okay, so here's a bunch of why we should worship God. If we would just sit down and begin to think about all of these attributes of God, that God is faithful, God loves us, God is our shepherd, God is God. God uh, is, is, it owns us. Then it will cause our hearts to desire to worship him. We will want to worship him. Okay, well, how do we do that? How do we worship God? Pastor Coyne, Pastor Herrick, I don't know how to do that. Tell me how to worship God. Well, this psalm will tell us how to do that. Okay, the how. Okay, we're going to talk about how to worship God. How do we worship? First of all, chapter 1, verse 1, or chapter 100, verse 1. Remember the title was at the beginning, so I put 1B here, but it's really right at the beginning of the verse. It says, shout for joy. Here's the, here's the, shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Shout for joy. Sometimes it is translated, make a joyful noise. That word noise means to shout. I looked up the background of this Hebrew word. It literally means a, a cry of triumph. You defeat your enemy in battle. And you don't walk home saying, well, I guess that was kind of a nice battle that we won. No, you get excited about it. We won! Remember that uh, old picture at the end of uh, World War II where that one Navy guy's got that one growl and he's got her bent down and he's kissing her. You got the real famous picture where there's, there's confetti flying all over the place and everyone's out in the streets because World War II was over and we had won the victory. David would go out and would slew the Philistines and he comes back and the people would begin to cry, Saul has slain his thousands. David has slain his ten thousands. That was a victory cry. That's what this Hebrew word is. We are to shout for joy in our worship. John, why don't we ever do that? We sing. We have other means of worship. We give. We give our talents and times, and there are ways we worship. But does this verse not clearly say that we should every once in a while shout out hallelujah because the Lord has blessed us? All right. 
let's pretend. This is going to be a long stretch. Two weeks back, that referee did not pick up that flag. <laughs> Megatron caught the ball or got the ball there. They got the first down. They went on to make the touchdown. And let's just pretend. I know, it's a long stretch. <laughs> let's just pretend the Lions beat Dallas. Then last week, I think the brackets would have worked out that they would have played Green Bay. And I know, just a few weeks back, they lost to Green Bay. But let's just pretend a miracle happened, and Detroit beats Green Bay. And now is in the divisional finals today. And Detroit beats... I don't know. I don't know how the, I don't know how the brackets break down. Ah, so the Lions are going to the Super Bowl. Whoa, buddy, this is exciting. Two weeks from this afternoon, you have rented a large screen TV. You invite a bunch of friends over to your house. You got the popcorn, you got the, the pop out there, you got snacks, and you sit down, and oh, the Super Bowl comes on, and the Lions are in the Super Bowl. Let's just say they're playing um, the Patriots, all right? And uh, um, 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 the Patriots quarterback, I just lost his name, Brady. Brady, Brady marches him down, and, and, and then um, Stafford marches the Lions down, and it gets into the fourth quarter, late in the fourth quarter. Brady marches him down one more time, and, and the Patriots are up by, let's say, five points. I don't know how you get a five-point difference, but then mathematically, there is a way to get a five-point difference there. And there's only 30 seconds to go. They kick off. The Detroit Lions start running it back, and let's just say they get up to the 30. And Stafford comes out, and, and, and they hike the ball. We're down to 15 seconds now, and Stafford drops back. And some of the Green Bay linemen break through, but Stafford steps to the side and eludes them. And, and, and Calvin Johnson is running down the sideline as fast as he can, and he outruns his defender. The safety starts coming over from the middle of the field, and Stafford drops back, and Stafford hauls off as long and as far as he can throw that. And Megatron, Calvin Johnson, runs under the ball, and right on his fingertip, he catches it. And he runs into the end zone as the time runs out. And Detroit wins the Super Bowl. What would happen in your living room? Your friend would jump off of the couch and the popcorn would go flying all over. And he'd be doing a victory dance and he'd be yelling. And you'd be yelling. You'd be all excited. How come? We get so excited about a football game, and that's okay to do that, but how come we get so excited about the football game, and when it comes to spiritual things, John, Pastor John is up here preaching. He's preaching about how Jesus, how, how, how mankind fell. And God had a plan in heaven to send his son to the earth. And Jesus comes to earth in the manger in Bethlehem. Jesus grows up and he teaches and he does miracles. And Jesus goes to the cross. And while Jesus is hanging on the cross, he cries out, It is finished! Meaning that our sin has been paid for. He gets placed in the grave, and three days later, he raised, he's raised from the dead. And we, by placing our faith and our trust in him, can have an eternal home in heaven. Think about Revelations. There's no more crying, no more pain. And you look at your watch. Oh, I wish John Coyne would hurry up and get done. He's kind of going long today. Yeah, John, outwardly you're going, yeah, yeah, John, okay, I agree with that, yeah, yeah, okay. But you're really thinking, oh, what are we going to have for lunch today? We got to go out to the restaurant, and what do they got? Oh, I'd like to have a nice, big, juicy hamburger. <laughs> That's what's running through our mind, huh? We ought to be jumping up and down like we did when the Lions, I'm talking about like it's a fact, like when the Lions won the Super Bowl. 
Jesus won the victory of our salvation, and that should be more exciting, and we should shout for joy to the Lord. Part of our worship, I think, ought to include shouting for joy over the great salvation that God has done for us. Shout for joy. Let me go on. Serve him. Now, that verse says, worship the Lord with gladness. That don't say serve, no, but if you look in that Hebrew word that is translated here, it's different than some of the other ones for worship. This one literally means to worship him with service. Now, that's the Hebrew word. You come to the New Testament. He, uh, Paul says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body. Romans 12, 1, that, I present your bo- that, you present, bleh, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your, the old King James says, reasonable service. Some of the newer translations say, it's, which is your worship of service. Okay, that word kind of combines our serving the Lord is an act of worship to him. Same thing with this Hebrew word. We should serve the Lord to honor and worship him. Now, notice what it says. Serve him with gladness. John comes up and he says, oh, we need some people to uh, uh, help set up Sunday mornings, or we need some people to... uh, to uh, teach a little kid Sunday school class, and, and uh, everyone kind of looks at you, and you say, okay, I'll do it. And then you go to do that. You come in early, and you're walking up the sidewalk to come in here long before the service starts, and you start grumbling. I don't know why I haven't volunteered for this stupid job to do this. And you come in, and you, okay, I'll do it, but I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it because I want to, only because they're making me do it. Is that serving the Lord with gladness? No. We need to serve the Lord and serve the Lord with gladness. Let's go on. This word means to worship the Lord by serving him. C, we should sing. Now we do do that in church on Sunday mornings. Here it says, come before him with joyful songs. Sunday mornings. God looks down, and God don't care how big the congregation is. God looks down on Anchor Community Church. And Dan is up here, or Rachel's up here, and leading us. And we look at those words, and we're singing those songs, and our heart just wants to worship the Lord. And we sing loudly, and we sing from our hearts, and we sing with joy. And you know what? The Lord looks down. You know what the Lord does? He smiles. The Lord is pleased when we sing with joy in our hearts to worship him. Now, not only the congregation, but you ought to do this in your own individual life. Get some of these songs down. Do you ever have it? I don't know. Maybe my mind is weird. Do you ever have it where a song gets stuck in your mind? Um, I'm ashamed to say this, but the other morning I got up and I was going in to take a bath and and I, I take baths, not showers. I like baths. I don't know why. But I, I come in there, and I'm singing to myself, 99 bottles of beer on the wall, 99 <laughs> bottles of beer. And I stop, and I say, where did that come from? Why is that in my mind? Then later in the day, there was a, I don't remember what com- carpet company, but there was a carpet commercial on that has that tune. It doesn't have those words, but it has that tune about selling carpets. And I thought, oh, that's where I picked it up. So just on the side, you can hear a song, and all of a sudden, it's stuck in your mind. Well, I like it when um, a Christian song, a worship song, gets stuck in my mind, and I can go through all day. One that's been in my mind lately was that we were made to thrive. You know the song I'm talking about? Joy unspeakable, and then it goes on, and I, I got to get that, that phrase down. But I just love it when I can worship the Lord. I do a lot of driving. Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, I leave Granville, and I drive up to Big Rapids. It's got about an hour drive. I teach at Ferris. Tuesday, Thursdays, I get in my car, and I drive out to Muskegon, about a 45-minute drive. And I spend time in my car worshiping, but I spend time in my car singing. I know, I was glad my windows are rolled up and there's nobody else in the car with me. I'm glad of that, but I spend time in my car singing. You know, 
You know what I've started doing this week? I've started yelling, hallelujah, right in the middle of my car. Nobody else is around, but that said, shout for joy to the Lord, so I want to worship the Lord by shouting to him. So I shout in my car. I sing in my car. We ought to do that. Sing, come before him with joyful songs, letter D. Acknowledge him. The beginning of verse 3 says, know that the Lord is God. Okay, if somebody were to command you to know something, I want you to know Einstein's theory of relativity. Know it right now. Know it. You'd say, well, huh? What? How, how do I know that? Well, the word really can be translated as acknowledge. Something that you already know in your mind, but you need to speak it out. You need to acknowledge that truth. And I think that that, in this case, is a better translation of that. We need to acknowledge that the Lord is God. We need to speak it out. We need to share that with others. We need to acknowledge that truth. Meditate, Meditate on it. Toss it over and over in your mind. Yeah? And then speak it out. That's the thing with this word. We acknowledge it means to speak it forth. The Lord is God. The Lord is God. The Lord is God. Acknowledge that he is Lord. E, thanks. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Thanksgiving, people, I know you probably don't realize this, but thanksgiving is not just a November holiday that you eat turkey on. Yeah, there's more to it than that. Huh? We should be willing to give thanks to the Lord all the time. One of the other things I do in the car, I talk about how I drive in the car a lot, uh, I listen to audiobooks, and I have been listening to Robinson Crusoe. Now, that's a neat book. I didn't realize it, but that is a very Christian book. It is. There are whole chapters devoted to him. He talks about in his younger years, he rebelled us against his parents, and he, he got on board ship and was drinking and was living a very wild life, and then the shipwreck, and he gets shipwrecked on this island, and he's able to rescue some things off of the ship, and he lived there for like 18, 19 years. We always think of him and his man Friday, but Friday didn't come onto the island until 18 years after he was living there by himself. But at a point on board that ship that he was getting stuff out, there was a Bible. And he took that Bible with him, and he began to read the Bible, and he repented of his sin, and he came to know the Lord. Very clearly stated in that book, Robinson Crusoe. I didn't realize it was that clearly of a Christian book. And there's one chapter in there where he begins to recount all of the things that he's been able to do and make and get along with on that island. And he said it was very hard for him to do this the first time. But he said he came to the point where he thanked the Lord that he was shipwrecked on that island. Because if he had not been, he would have still probably been living a very wild life among all of the sailors that he had been with, seeking money, seeking fortune, and not seeking the Lord. While he, and I know, it's a fiction. But I looked it up. Daniel Defoe was a Presbyterian minister back in the late uh, 1600s, early 1700s, and he wrote the book to point out that the Word of God can change your life all by itself. He didn't need a preacher. He didn't need anyone else on there. He just began to read the Bible. And he came to the point where he was thankful for the circumstances of his life. One of the terms that John mentioned last week was content. And I think a big part of contentment is thankfulness. Being thankful for what we have in our life right now. Are you thankful? Think about the life that you live with a warm heart. I got up the other morning and it was what, 8, 10 below here in Grand Rapids. And our furnace was running and I was in a nice warm home and I took a nice warm bath and and uh, just imagine if you didn't have a nice warm home with a good dependable furnace and a hot water heater. I put in one of my K-cups into my Keurig maker and I made me a cup of coffee and I sat back on the couch in a nice warm house and it was, it was wind chill was like 23 below zero and I was nice and warm. Huh? 
thankful. Thankful for all the blessings that we have. A couple more. Oh, yeah, later on it says, give thanks to him. F, praise him. Now, I want to I show you something. In 4B, it says, enter his courts with praise. Now, that is the Hebrew word hallel. Do you know of a word that is similar to that that we say in English quite often? Hallelujah. Yes, that's the first part of that. That luya on the end means praise him. Give praise to him. Do you realize when we say hallelujah, it is really a command telling others you are to praise God? Anyway, so hallel is, uh, we are to enter his courts with hallel. Then later on, um, it says, praise his name in 4C, praise his name. Another Hebrew word that is the Hebrew word barak. So we have hallel and barak, two Hebrew words that can be translated as praise him, but they got slightly different meanings. The word halal means to boast about the Lord. I think that's kind of neat definition. You know, you, you look at, you think of two little kids sitting in a classroom together, and the one kid is bragging that his, he, his dad can beat up on the other kid's dad. You know, he's boasting about his dad. My dad could beat your dad up, you know. We ought to be able to boast about our God, how great our God is. Boast about him. And the other word, the other Hebrew word, barak, means to bow down to the ground and submit, submit everything in your life to him. That's how we praise him, submitting to him. I got one more? No, conclusion. First of all, why should we worship the Lord? He is God. He owns us. He is a shepherd. He is good. He loves us and he is faithful. That's who he is and why we should worship him. How do we worship him? We should shout with joy of victory songs to him. We should sing. We should be thankful. We should serve him with our lives. I wonder. Do you truly worship the Lord? Or are spiritual things in your life kind of boring? The Super Bowl is more exciting to you than what Jesus Christ did for you. Huh? Think about that. And maybe there's somebody here this morning who doesn't know the Lord Jesus is their Savior. God loved you. God sent his son and Jesus died on the cross for your sins so that you can have a home in heaven. You need to submit yourself to him. Accept Jesus Christ as your savior. Allow him to be the Lord of your life and begin to allow him to change your life and worship and honor him.